Before we begin then, let us all take a moment to remind ourselves how fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching. And it is because of Him, the most merciful one, the undefeated and one Christian one, He who is the fount of all wisdom, compassion and loving kindness, we have the truth that has been uncovered for us. Being grateful to both him and those who have considered it their duty and their responsibility to pass on this wisdom down to us, our forefathers. Let us make veneration to our master. And as we do so, let us also remind ourselves that we are here with purpose and this is as much a veneration to his name as much as it is a pledge and an oath that we take upon ourselves to free ourselves from suffering once and for all. So let us now bring our palms together to pay homage to the most magnificent one, the Supreme Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa we run an effort on a journey of discovery. We are all explorers. But we are not wandering explorers, thankfully. We are explorers on a course that has been charted for us. We have purpose, we have direction. We know that our journey is going to be fruitful. It is not just a mere venture. We are not just hopeful that one day we are confident one day. Because we know that there is light at the end of this tunnel. Some of us have seen it. Others are yet to see it. And regardless, our forefathers have most definitely seen it. Having seen it, they traveled this path they traveled, they made this journey, and they charted this journey. They mapped it out for us. And they have revealed to us every bend, every corner, every turn, every milestone. So whether it is virtue that we have to fulfill, be it our concentration, our samadhi, or be it our wisdom. There is never a question about what we have to do next. If there's anything ever to be grateful for, it is that. We're not like Columbus, who sailed on a big boat, ever hopeful one day he will land. But rather, we are like now man aiming for the moon. Because the first moon lander landed on the moon. Many centuries ago, every journey that is made to the moon now is not just hopeful, but it is confident. Because they are confident that it's out there, that they can reach it, 
they can land on it. That is the confidence that we all have. Therefore, we must always be rest assured because our forefathers have made this journey. We must always be grateful because they have all made this journey and they have told us what it's like and they have revealed all about it, every nook and every corner, what the pitfalls are, where you've got to be careful and where you can just be plain smooth, smooth sailing without a fear, without a worry, where you've got to take caution, where you can speed up and where you must slow down, the rough patches and the smooth patches, all this have been really revealed to us. So therefore, confidently, we take this journey. See, I can only imagine what it must have been like for the first man for whom there was no teacher, to whom there was no guidance, to whom there was no instruction, to whom there was no rule book, no playbook, no guidebook. No signposts, no warning signs, no bend ahead or no slow down signs. Now that was a real adventure. The adventure into the unknown. But today, our journey is not so. Today we have books, volumes of it, written on how to make this journey. There are always those who are ahead of us. Always. So we can just follow in their footsteps. I don't think there's been a better time. I really don't think there's been a better time to make this journey. It gives me great pleasure to see the vast majority of you with your prayer mats on your shoulders. This is your claim to the Sambuddha Sasana. An insignia which cries out loud, I want this. I want this freedom. I want to taste it. I want to enjoy it. It is mine. I want to have it. As a monk, as an Anagarika, or an Anagarika, as a Sila Sravaka, or a Sila Sravika, or a Sila Vesi, for now, dot, dot, dot. It gives me great pleasure. It gives me great pleasure to see, to realize that merit really is a force to be reckoned with. That it is true what our forefathers said, merit will see you well. It will see you through the difficult times in life. I want all of you to just take a moment to consider where you are now and where you started. That is a personal journey for all of you. Your beginnings are very different, although your ending will be the same. Just take a moment and, go and trace your steps back. I'm not just talking about yesterday. I'm talking about several weeks ago, months ago, years ago for some of you several years ago. Just remember, take a moment to remind yourselves where you were. The lifestyle that you led, the livelihood that you thought you had to deal with, that you thought that you were stuck in, there was no refute. The predicaments of life that you saw no end to, the vicissitudes of life that you know so remedy to, 
Just take a moment to remind yourselves. How you knew that the only answer to vexation was relief? Remember? That is all you knew, like the back of your palm. The remedy to vexation was always relief. If it was aversion, then releasing your pressures on someone else or something else. If it was desire, then releasing your vexation, even at the cost or the expense of someone or something else. Where it was delusion, it was still releasing your vexation. Belittling someone else, making someone else feel small and insignificant. But think about today, think about now. Think about your response to such vexations today. Today you're actually doing something meaningful, aren't you? You know that when you want ice cream, lapping it up is not the answer. That is why there is never a final lap. Was there? But you, as Anagarikas or Samin Mahanses, monks at this monastery, when was the last time you got to lap up any ice cream? Well, you seem to be doing just fine. But you remember back in your lay lives, there was never a final lap. One was always followed by another. And it was not just the same old, it had to be something new. You wanted variety. Even if it was variety for the next one, and then even if you had to go back to the old one, that would be fine for as long as there was some variety in between two monotonous instances. Just think about it. Think about how much the Buddha Sasana has relieved you, has given you freedom, has given you release. Take a moment to think about, if you can't remember what your life was like, remember or remind yourself the lives of those you left behind. It is a fairly good representation of what your life was like. If you still keep in contact with any of the people you've left behind, your friends, your siblings and so on, When they have a problem, who do they call? When they have a pressure, who do they call? When they need answers to, to problems, who do, they, who do they call? Who do they come looking for answers? They're still lost. Because they didn't have the courage, perhaps, or the guts, perhaps, to make that jump, to take that step forward. Today they're still looking for answers. But every turn you take, if it's the wrong one, you'd all just, just keep getting lost, one turn after the other. But life is very different now. Do you not feel that you are moving closer and closer to freedom with every passing day? Sometimes perhaps a day maybe is not long enough for you to experience any real change, but if you just take a moment to reflect on maybe the last year, try and take a moment to think about what you were doing this time last year. The pressures and the vexations that haunted you, that tormented you this time last year, this time two years ago, some months ago. If you've given yourself a reasonable amount of time for some change to have happened, then you know what I'm talking about. I speak from my own experience. This is not something I read off a book. This is not a, something I watched on TV. I'm talking about my first-hand experience. Because we have a journey we can take, just follow the signposts, just take the guidance, just take the instruction, step by step. 
Whereas the first man who walked this path, he had no one to teach him, no one to guide him, no one to instruct him. He just went on a hunch. Merit was his fuel. And just he went on, he just went on a hunch. No instruction, no guidance. But today, as I say, there's never been a better time to make this journey. Today we have the pristine Dhamma that is so on the point, that is so clear, crystal clear. We have role models who don't just preach, who don't just give the talk, but they actually walk the talk. So we, ha we are able to see through our own eyes the difference that the Dhamma can make in people's lives. And that gives us confidence. So all we have to do is just follow in their footsteps. You know, today, whenever I feel that someone has managed to achieve something, when people come up to me and say, be that a monk or a, or a Nanagarika Mahatmi or a Nanagarika, Swami Nahansa, I used to be like this, I used to have these problems, but they don't bother me anymore. It makes me really happy because let's just imagine I haven't got there yet, personally. Say my teacher says to me, you know, I used to be like this, but now I feel such a tremendous sense of joy and freedom. Perhaps I haven't achieved it yet, but it gives me great pleasure and delight to hear it because I know the path ahead is clear and it takes us to that destination. I wait for the day my teacher tells me the job is done. I wait for the day to hear that. I long for it. I don't know if he'll ever tell me that because he always says that is only something that is to be shared with one's own teacher. So therefore, I take confidence in my own change, in my own transformation. And that was the Buddha's guidance as well. How do you know that this teaching is right? Look within, introspect. See how much you are freed from the fires of desire, aversion and delusion. And if you, free, if you sense that sense of freedom, then what more evidence do you need? What more proof do you need that the Dhamma works? So, I urge you, from time to time, take a moment to look back, because otherwise you'll be far too busy looking forward. As you're ascending a hill, the tendency is just to keep looking up and to think to yourself, I have more way to go, there's more to go. The pinnacle looks, seems, seems so far away and I'm tired and it's getting tougher and tougher. Perhaps this, the, the stretch up ahead looks steeper and that can sometimes be disconcerting. It can sometimes be discouraging. And in those moments, don't forget, take a look back. Just turn your head around and take a look back. Far and yonder you will see those people that didn't have the courage to take that first step with you. They'll be still there crying and weeping and lamenting, fighting with each other, fighting over petty things like unsettled scores, grudges. There'll be friends and enemies. As you look back, you'll see all this. You'll see your siblings fighting over land which they think ought to belong to them. You'll see your friends fighting, quabbling, quarreling over insignificant things, things that have no meaning at all because they're just lost in a mist of delusion. You'll see all this and then remind yourself, I was once there. So as you take a moment to 
spare compassion towards them, also remind yourself the victories that you have won along the way, all those milestones you have passed. So I speak out to all of you, particularly those with one of those prayer mats on your shoulders. You have made the right choice, the perfect choice. This is the only choice with no regrets, I assure you. If you have any doubt, just take my word for it. The only choice with no regrets. Every other choice, there's a price to pay. Here, there's just everything to earn and nothing to pay. So revel in the choice you have made. Rejoice in the choice you have made. The color of your prayer mat, your prayer mat needn't worry. It needn't bother you. It's all grey after all, matters not what shade it is, is it? My prayer mat is just a darker shade of grey, that's all. It comes in fifty shades. So you need not worry. What matters is, you have one on your shoulder. It is your vote of confidence in the sasana. It is you claiming out loud, I want to make a change in myself. In the name of happiness, I realize that it is I who has to change. That is what this prayer mat says. It is I who have to change. So when there are those times where you feel perhaps a bit exhausted maybe, or you feel that progress seems to be slower than usual, or none at all, it may seem like that from time to time. You needn't fear, you needn't worry, just take a look back. Every inch moved forward is, an, is a step moved forward. It's forward, how, more, how much more forward can you go? It's forward. Every inch makes a difference. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Great leaps, they happen from time to time. Big, momentous steps forward, they happen from time to time. Sometimes your journey forward, your little progress, your minor victories may seem like nothing to write home about, but it means everything to you, does it not? You are who you are because of every step you took. You are where you are because of every step you took, not just the first step. But there's only one journey that never ends. And what is that journey? The one that you don't begin. If you've begun your journey, then don't worry when it will end. Just have confidence that it will. So I salute you. I honor you. I respect you because you deserve it. That prayer mat on your shoulder is your vote of confidence in the Noble Triple Gem. It is your claim that there is no other remedy to suffering, that there is no other path to freedom. So when in doubt, no, not check it out, when in doubt, turn around and check it out. When in doubt, remind yourself that in these situations, you responded very differently back then, but today your responses are very different. I think you know that. But I remind you because it is necessary to rejoice in that, to rejoice in those victories, because no one may ever tell you. You may, no one may ever come and sing praises about it. 
that it is yours. The victory is yours. There is only one victory that cannot be taken from you. And that is the victory over oneself. All other victories can be stolen. Everything else you win can be reconquered. But your victory over yourself, that is yours to keep. So don't count your victories by the number of material possessions that you have. Do remember that all that you will leave behind one day. We came into this world without as much as a thread on our bodies and how do you think we are going to be leaving? Just the same. It is just a nice story that we like to tell ourselves while we are roaming on the surface of this planet. Look at all these things that I have to my name. Look at all these big things and all these little things. They all belong to me, they're all mine. These are nice stories that we like to tell ourselves. Today you have nothing to your name, but you have everything. Without the fear, without the worry, you have everything. So once again, I salute you. Give yourselves a pat on the back. And remember, this was the journey you were bound to take. This was your destiny. Although you may not remember today, when our great master would have once taken his journey to his salvation, when our forefathers would have taken their journey to their salvation in his footsteps, we would have been the ones stood alongside. We would have been the ones who cheered them on. We would have been the ones who said, yes, do it for yourself and for us as well. And show us the path so that one day we may traverse in your footsteps. We were the ones who stood on either side and said, hurrah, hurrah. We cheered them on. That you don't remember today. So today, as you make this journey, there will be others who will be stood on your side saying, hurrah, hurrah. They will cheer them on and let them do so. Because everyone who gives a cheer, as much as a cheer, just a sadhuka, they will all join this troop. That is why it is so important to encourage others on, to give an encouraging word, if that is all you can spare, to be a good example, to, con to conduct yourself in a way that inspires other people, that inspires joy in their hearts, that inspires reverence in their hearts. That is why you treat everyone who walks through those gates as one of your family, because you know that one day they will be one of your family. That's important. Just as those who walked this path before us did to us, we shall do to them. So I want you to take a moment, especially in those times where things seem difficult, seems tough, sometimes when you feel that everyone else is progressing much faster than I am, you may feel this way. When you feel that Everyone else is just, you know, they're just living a very carefree life. They don't seem to have any problems, but I am the one who's got all the problems. All the pressures just keep landing on my shoulders. Can the path to Nibbana be so torturous? Can the path to Nibbana be so difficult? Can it be such a challenge? From time to time you might feel this way. I speak to all of you. From time to time... You might question yourself and others might even ask you, was it worth it? When you left home, you said you were going to achieve your salvation and you were going to do it in this birth and you were going to be doing it soon enough. Have you achieved it? From time to time you will have people ask you this. They'll ask you, how's the weather over there? 
over on that side. They'll ask you. Just be patient. Be patient. Be understanding. Have compassion. A fish in water only knows what water is like. They don't know what land is like. For that, they have to take a leap of faith first and then jump onto land. That is the only way you can ever know what land is like. You can read about what land is like on a book. You can watch it on a film or in a film, but to actually know what land is like, a fish has to take the courage to use its fins if it must and walk on shore. Then it'll know this is what land is like. So those who have taken that leap of faith, those who have made that journey, there will be those who will question you because they don't know what it's like. So they will question. Because when you have an answer to hand, they will not be concerned with an answer to heart. You, on the other hand, you realize that the answer to hand is not what you're after, but the answer to your heart's misery. So rejoice in your merits. Rejoice in what you have achieved, in your successes and your victories. Have compassion always towards those who have yet to make that jump, yet to make that choice and yet to make that decision. Always spare a word, lend a hand wherever you can. Just as those who walked this path before you did to you and did for you, do the same for them. These are all important reasons as to why you need to turn back from time to time. But before you help someone, make sure that you are steady. That is also very important. Sometimes we have seen on occasion where people, they go to help others and if you are not out the pit, trying to help someone out of it is only a very foolish thing. So, for yourself and for others, ensure that you are safe, you are steady. And the only assurance that you can give yourself, which, whether you will always and forever remain in the sasana, is are you practicing right now? Your practice in the past is no assurance that you will remain in the future. To remain today, you have to practice today. To remain in the future, you have to practice in the future. You remained in the past because you practiced in the past. That's the way it is. Practice, practice, practice. Until your job is done. Until you know there is nothing more to do. So I want you to use these teachings. The Dhamma to help you move forward and progress on your journey whilst you take a moment from time to time to enjoy the distance that you have come thus far. And also, as you take a moment to rejoice in your success, take a look around you. When you go in arms, perhaps, when you see other people, devotees or to be devotees, listeners, practitioners, potential practitioners who come along wishing to make a change in their lives, look at them and enjoy, rejoice, be happy that this is what we've all been able to achieve as one force. You've heard of the Air Force, this is the Buddha Force. And we're all members of that. You know those prayer mats on your shoulders? It is not just for convenience you wear it on your shoulder. It is not a mere adornment that you have on your shoulder to say that you are an Anagarika or a monk. Because when you have that prayer mat on your shoulder, people ask you a question. Why? What is that? Why are you different? What does it symbolize? It tells the story of the sasana. 
You know, a mat is supposed to be under your feet, right? That is where a mat is supposed to be. Because you are above it and the mat is below you. But when you wear it on your shoulder, now what does it say? The mat is above me and I am below it. It says what you have, what you hope to achieve and what you have achieved by coming into this asana. I am prepared to be a mat to a mat. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? I am prepared to be a mat to a mat. That is a symbol. So there is great significance in what you do. So when, so have, you know, wear, both wear it with pride as well as wear it with compassion. Sometimes when you go out and about, you might have the prayer much on your, on your shoulders. Now Anagarika Mahathas, they, they do that. Anagarika Mahathas as well. Some of you we've requested when you leave the monastery, take it off because you go back to your own, your usual regular life. But if you are always a symbol of the sasana, then by wearing it on your shoulder, people stop to question. They ask you, what is this? What is this all about? What, is, what does that represent? It tells without a single word what the sasana is. I'm here to be a mat to a mat. I'm willing to be, I'm willing to take second place. I'm willing to take a step back. I'm willing to think about others before I think about myself. That is a symbol. So even while you're here at the monastery, just by being a walking symbol of the Buddha Sasana in itself is a hugely meritorious deed. Because as others look at you, they will also want to make that change in their lives. Every day we get new faces, new people walking through these gates. And they look around. They want to see what this monastery has to offer. It's like when you walk into a store. You want to know what the store has to offer. And when they walk in here, they want to know what the monastery has to offer. And then they look at you. Because when you come here, you know, there's no pagoda to look at. There's no bodhi tree to look at. If there are, this, it's a, at a far distance, barely visible. So what they look at are the people. They look at men and women, and sometimes children walking around. But they carry a prayer mat on their shoulder. Very strange. Mats are not supposed to be on the shoulder. Where are they supposed to be? Under the feet. So what's a mat doing on a shoulder? Then they'll stop to ask you, what is this mat doing on your shoulder? I have become a mat to a mat. That is your answer. And they'll ask you, but how? Ah, let me tell you my story. You know, as I think about the change that you have gone through in your lives, I'm reminded very fondly about a particular Anagarika Mahatya that we have at the monastery. He's earned himself a nickname. I was informed a couple of days ago. So I've been asking, you know, I ask around, you know, how is this Anagarika Mahatya doing? How is that Anagarika Mahatmya doing? And so on from their teachers. And the fellow Anagarika Mahatmya came and told me that there's a particular Anagarika Mahatya who's earned himself a nickname. His nickname is No Complaints. Whenever asked or questioned, are you comfortable? Do you need a mattress? Do you need a, a duvet? How's the food? His answer is No Complaints. Is it too warm for you? No complaints. Perhaps too cold for you then? No complaints. Can you understand what Guru Hamdra is teaching you? 
no complaints. How's the food? Are you settling in okay? Is it too sour? Is it too spicy? Is it too salty? No complaints. He's earned himself a nickname. We call him Mr. No Complaints. A mat to a mat. Because a mat never complains, does it? Trample all over it, step on it, jump on it, do whatever. A mat doesn't complain. When you're a mat to a mat, then by your very nature, no complaints. See what a great story that is. Ask yourselves. Are you all like that? Do you complain? Or are you no complaints? Do you find yourself whining about something all the time? This thing or that thing or the other? Do you, com do you find yourself complaining about what you have to live up to or live up, live with or what you don't have? Do you find yourself complaining? See, when, when they say no complain, I'm sure that's not always meaning I have no issues, I have no worries, I have no annoyances. But what they're really saying is, I understand that things can be difficult from time to time. It can be vexatious. It can be hard to swallow. But I understand that the answer to this is not a complaint. The answer to this is a self-transformation. That is what the Dhamma is for. See, so when I hear these stories, I... These are perfect opportunities for us to look back, think about where we started, think about what, how we were when we were at the beginning of our journeys. Perhaps today, you're, you have no complaints, but maybe back then you did. But maybe still, perhaps still, perhaps still you have complaints. That's okay. Remember that there are those ahead of you for whom there are no complaints. So rejoice in that. Rest assured that if you keep walking on this path, you can all achieve that. You know, that is a perfect destination for all of us to have in our minds. Can we become someone who has no complaints? Meaning we always accept things equanimously. Whatever the world throws at us, we take it on board gracefully. Nothing ever bothers us. Nothing is ever too much or too little. Nothing is ever too much of a bother, too much of an annoyance. You know, if you keep that fixed, no complaints, keep that fixed and then transform ourselves to be able to say that genuinely. That is a good goal, a good ambition to have. See, that we can set for ourselves as a personal goal. A goal, of course, needs to have a time, right? So you can set yourself, set that as a goal. If you've just come and joined us, uh, you know, maybe as a Sila Shravika, or maybe a Shravika, or maybe a Sila Vesi, or so on, right? set yourselves a goal. Right? Perhaps today you have complaints about this, that, or the other. Perhaps. Maybe as an Upasaka or an Upasaka at home, maybe you have a few complaints about something. Maybe you still have complaints about your other half. Maybe you have complaints with, about your friends and about members of your family. Can you become someone who has no complaints? Keep that fixed and then chart a journey from where you are to that destination. It's one thing to be able to say it, but it's one thing to actually feel that way. You know, you can just say it, you have no complaints. 
but you, when they walk away, you start swearing at them. That's one way of going about it. But can you actually be someone who genuinely, who can say how they actually feel? Right? Can you actually speak out loud and say how you actually feel? When someone asks, you know, like, generally when people bump into each other, they ask you, like, how are you doing? And normally the answer to that is, I'm fine. You know, that's what you're supposed to say, right? Especially if they're not someone you know very much, then you're supposed to say, I'm good, I'm fine. Even when you have a hundred and a hundred and one problems on your head and it's, you know, it's, it's been a terrible day, you're still supposed to say, yeah, I'm good, I'm fine. That's what you're supposed to say because you don't want to start going into <laughs> the ins and outs of all the problems in your life. But what if you could always mean that when you say it? Someone asks you, how are you? You say, I'm fine. Because that is almost an immediate answer. It's like, it's, it's almost automatic, isn't it? How are you doing? I'm fine. Really? <laughs> Not always. Sometimes you just say it because it's the, it's, the, it's the right thing to say. But can you become someone who actually feels that way? I'm fine. You sure? Yeah, absolutely. I'm fine. Wonderful. How are you doing? I'm good. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I'm marvelous. I'm doing brilliant. No complaints. Not just verbally, but actually internally, you feel that way. But, you know, that's a great virtue. So, keep that fixed. Become someone who has no complaints. Keep that fixed. And then, transform yourself to achieve that, that goal, to achieve that target. So, that is what being an Anagarika is like. That is what being an Anagarika is about. Becoming someone who has no complaints. And, you know, the word Anagarika, it means one who has no home. Hmm? It means one who has no home. Or one who is not bound to an abode, to a home. Na Agarika. is an Anagarika. Now, I'm sure you understand what that means, literally. So that is one who is not at home, one who has left home. One perhaps who has renunciated. An Anagarika. But it has a greater meaning than that. Our home is our comfort zone, isn't it? There's a saying, home is where the heart is. Yeah? What is meant by that? What do you mean by where the heart is? It's where the, it's where the heart likes to linger. It's where the heart feels joy. It's where the heart enjoys. It's where the heart feels pleasure. It's where the heart likes to stay. By the heart we mean, of course, the what? The mind, absolutely. You're talking about yourself. That is home, where you like to be, the way you like to be. Where you like to be and the way you like to be. What you like to do, how you like to be, the people like you like to be with, the things you like to do. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, all these things and your preferences, your likes. These are all homes where you like to be. Because if you have a place where you only see what you like to see, now think about your home for a second. What do you fill your homes up with? Hmm? Other people's trash perhaps, but your? What? Your treasure. Agreed? They sell it to you for, for, for a few bucks. You buy that trash and you come and fill your homes with it. No? Brick a brack, hmm? little ornaments. And if you go on a Sunday, so go to the Sunday fair. Now you walk along the street, maybe you go to a, what do you call them, booth sales. Now you just walk around and you see these little ornaments, like when you go on a holiday. Right? or maybe to another country, 
And you see these little souvenirs, right? And these little sh- shops, shacks more like, and they sell them on the side, on either side of the road, and you feel like you have to take one of them. And if you go to, perhaps if you say you go to London, you feel like you have to take uh, the London Eye with you. You have to take a little red red telephone box with you to remind to remind yourself. You go to uh, Australia, you feel like you have to bring a little kangaroo to remind yourself that you've been there. Right? This is all trash. If it weren't trash, they wouldn't sell it to you. If it was a treasure, they would keep it for themselves. Right? So if you fill your your homes up with, come on, say it, other people's trash. What do you give up in turn? Your treasure. Yes. You give up your treasures and you buy other people's trash. So, because, you know, they have, they have nowhere to put them. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like when these shopkeepers, right, when they run out of room to put their, their merchandise, okay? Are you ready for this? I feel evil today. Take the sari emporium. <laughs> These shopkeepers, when they have nowhere to put their stock, right, their stock rooms are filled up, the shop aisles, they are all filled up, you know, and there's no more room to put stuff. What they do is, they pay you a little rent. To keep it. They, they give it to you. They give it to you and say, just keep it. We'll take it back later. You pay them. You pay them money. Right? You pay them money. And you open your homes. And you arrange a storeroom for them. Just think for a moment. I'll prove the point to you. Just think for a moment about how many items of clothing you bought from a store. Sometimes never to have worn them. Maybe once, and that was in the fitting room. Before you left the store. That was it. You brought it home, and it's still in the cupboard. So because they have nowhere to put it, right? the, the small price that they pay is letting you try it on once. So, you know, they, you can't, they can't call it brand new after that. But you take it back, and generally what happens is, when you realize that you've now got too much stuff in your home, you send it back round. <laughs> you send it back round. It goes to somebody else. Perhaps, you know, they have their own, in, in, their, in their company, they have another arm that deals with used stuff. Right? So they'll buy back the used stuff that you, that you bought off them, but for a heavily discounted price, just because you wore it once, Right? And then they'll sell it on to somebody else. This is big business. But you don't realize this is what you're going through. This is what you do to yourselves. Because when you have treasure, you are so eager to part with it, to take on board other people's trash. It's, you know, in the kuti that I am in, there is nothing there that I don't use on a daily basis. I have very few things there, but those things I use on a daily basis, either for my benefit or the benefit of others. There is, there are no, I don't have any ornaments. I don't have any memorabilia. I don't have any souvenirs. Because what I eat, I leave behind then and there. I don't carry it with me. I'm very quick to digest. What goes in, goes out, immediately. I don't carry it with me. This is metaphorical. But what do people generally do? When they have an experience, they want to carry that experience with them. When you go to London and you see the London now, you see the River Thames, you see the Parliament, you, you want to be able to reminded, be reminded of that experience. So you take a little statue, perhaps, or a London eye, 
just a little tiny thing, you bring it home and you leave it on your desk. Maybe first of all you leave it on your desk soon after you come come from your holiday. After that it goes in a in a, in a drawer, then it goes into a cupboard somewhere, then it goes into a box somewhere, then it goes into this little store cupboard, cupboard that you have at home where you put in all that stuff before it has to be thrown away because you can't bring yourself up to throw it away because you feel like you paid money for it. Like this hoarding culture, typically Asian, hoarding culture. You know it's going to be dumped, but you can't just throw it immediately. It's like, you know, your fridges. And much of the stuff in there will eventually end in the bin, but it's not nice to just throw it like that. You have to cool it before you throw it, right? Hmm? You have to cool it before you throw it. Because we don't feel like letting anything go. We feel like we have to, we are the guardians of all that. We have to protect everything. Just in case. This is that mindset. Just in case mindset. So you fill your homes up with all, the, all kinds of rubbish, all kinds of trash. I, you know, I, I urge you, when you go get home today, hmm, when you get home today, this is pointless advice to the Anagarika Mahatmyas and the Anagarikas because they have a list of things that they can keep. You have a list that has to be approved by your teacher, itemized. I have my robe, I have my prayer mat, I have two pens. Then the teacher asks, why two? No, seriously, why two? You have to have an answer to that. So you can't have a box of pens. No. You have, I have a pillow and I have a pillow case. I have a Buddha statue. Let's say three or four of them say I have Buddha statues and they're all in the same kuti. You don't all need Buddha statues. Get rid of them. One enough for the kuti. Simplicity. Because what you own you have to maintain. So I, 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 this is a nice task you can do for yourselves when you get back home. You know, pick one room per day, because if you did the whole house, you would not be able to finish on one day. So pick one room and make a list of all the things you have in there. <clears throat> and then ask yourself, do you really need them? Ask yourself, is that treasure or trash? Hmm? It, it, you will learn a lot about yourself. Is it treasure or trash? Trash or treasure? Treasure or trash? Make a list of all the things you have at home. And if you share your home with someone else, especially if there's someone who come, come along with you, you know, share that list with somebody else, the things that belong to you and the things that be belong to them. You know, discuss between yourselves, especially if you're you know, a family. This is very easy to do. Husbands and wives, if you're here, you know, it's very easy to do. Make a list of things that belong to you, make a list of things that belong to him, then you'll find things that belong to nobody. <laughs> That'll happen. <laughs> like the children. <laughs> Just kidding. And then share it with each other. See, these are the things that belong to me. Then allow them to question. Do you really need that? When was the last time you used that? Why do we put aside room for that? Why do we leave room for that in our house? Do we really need that? Does it have to be on the mantle? Does it have to be in this... In the, you know, in old homes they used to have this thing called a showcase, right? Yeah, showcases. Usually what ends up there are old liquor bottles. <laughs> you seen that in old homes? Sometimes empty liquor bottles. Sometimes just ornaments people have picked up from here, there, everywhere. Like cutlery. The finest china. That never get used. Only when a visitor comes. And in some homes they have, you know, you have the like you have your furniture. There's the furniture that can be used by members of the house, and there's furniture that cannot be used by them. They're all covered up in polythene or bed sheets and so on. <laughs> there's, there's the love for the family. <laughs> That's love for the strangers. So they, th those sheets only come out when visitors come. <laughs> I don't know, you know, <laughs> part of 
just the way you know we've been brought up, I suppose. But make a list of the things you have at home. I mean, there's no harm in anagarika, mahatmis, anagarikas doing this as well, but you should have already done this by now. And be accountable for each and every one of them. Take it to your teacher or take it to an account, your accountability partner and get them to question. Why do you have this? When was the last time you used it? If there are, if you, you'll realize soon enough that there are a lot of things that you exchange treasure for and now you're left with a lot of trash. So once you realize this is just trash, then what do you do with trash? Do you need me to say what to do with trash? No. You know what to do with trash, then do what you do with trash. So that is what a lot of shopkeepers do. They're very intelligent. When they have no room to put their merchandise, you are willing to pay to be their storekeepers. You'll take it home with you and keep it there because they have no room to put it. When the new edition comes out, when the new version comes out, they have old stock. And what do they do? Half price. Hmm? Enough to convince you to take their trash and fill your precious homes up with. Impulsive buying. Especially when you feel like you're getting a good price. Yeah? Because the fear of loss, the fear of loss is is great in the human heart. The fear of loss. That's why when whenever they, people want to get rid of things, they'll just say, uh, the last dozen. Hmm? Going fast, going soon. Clear and stock. You fall for that all the time. <laughs> they have plenty of it back in the storeroom. But they just put a board up saying, clear and stock. Price is going down. Hmm? Enough to convince you to go and spend your treasure in exchange for their trash. Be mindful, you know, the world is out to get you and you can't fault them for that because they've got to make a living, they've got to make their money and, you know, they only know one way to make money and that is by getting it out of you. So, but, you know, it's your fault if you fall, fall victim to that. Just have, you know, have your wits about you. Have a good sense about you. And, you know, always, before you become a guardian of the galaxy, right, ask yourself, is it worth it? Do I, do I need another thing to worry about? Do I need another thing to fear myself about? Right? Even if it's something you don't use, if it's still on the fireplace, right? when, you, when you drop it, it's still, you know, when it cracks, it sends a crack in your heart as well, because you're still attached to it. It might not mean, mean much, and you don't even use it, but you still feel that it belongs to you. So why bother in the first place? So I, I, I can't I can't advise you to do this. I can't I can't I suppose get you to do this, but I would like to invite you to do this. Make a list of the things you don't need at home and don't bring them here, by the way. That's what you do to all Buddha statues and little puppies, right? Thankfully, no one does it at a monastery, but I know in temples all around the country, there are all Buddha statues, like with their heads off. <laughs> People don't feel like they can throw it away, so what do they do? They come and leave it by the Bodhi tree. Out of respect, I, I understand. I understand why people do that. But I don't know. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that because that's like saying, this is my, 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 my trash. And I don't know what to do with it, so I'll just take it to the temple. Seriously? To the temple? Is that where you should go and leave your trash? That's how you end up with, with temple with so many little dogs running around. When the, when, when the, the female dog at home she has her puppies, right? And if it's too many <laughs> to have at home, they normally end up in the temple. Why? Oh, well, they'll be fed. Someone will give them some food. 
So that becomes now the chief monk's, the chief incumbent monk's responsibility, the upkeep of dogs, both two-legged and four-legged. <laughs> Don't be like that. Don't you ever be that one. I mean, that is not what a temple is for. A temple is sacred. Hmm. It is sacrosanct. It is pure. That is what a temple is. It is a symbol of your destination. It is not where you should go and just throw your trash. Anyhow, I get carried away. What were we talking about? Prayer mat. How did prayer mat get there? Anyone? <laughs> we just got lost, didn't we? Right, let's come back then. So, someone was asking me recently about loneliness. And they were asking me, Samina said, what, what, do you, what do you think about loneliness? And so we had a little chat. And I thought it might be useful for us to share some ideas on that loneliness. See, I, I think that the greatest fear that any man has is the fear of being lonely or becoming lonely. Sometimes you've you have, like, have you not seen those people who have no friends, but they'll have maybe a pet at home? Sometimes they have no friends because they just can't get along with people, but they'll, they'll have someone or yeah, at least an animal. Maybe it doesn't have to be a dog. It, it can just be even a, like a pet lizard, something. Take a moment to think about why loneliness feels like such an ailment to the heart. Why does it feel so heavy? You will have experienced these moments, moments in life where you felt lonely. Why does loneliness, why is loneliness such a burden on the heart? And there's an answer to that, a very profound and deep one. It can all be explained through the Dhamma that we've been talking lately. But, you know, these are emotions of the heart which we need to now analyze through the Dhamma. If you're someone who's ever felt lonely, here's what's happened to you. When you feel lonely, it's when you have no one to assure you that you exist. That is a feeling of loneliness. I'll say that again. Loneliness is a feeling that you have when you have no one to assure you that you exist. Friends, people, companions that you have with you, you know, just even if they were deaf or they were mute, just having someone who can respond to you just having someone who can respond to you, you know, to respond to you means they have acknowledged you. Even if it's just someone to fight with all the time. You know, that's why some people, you know, they feel, some, some couples, all they do is fight. Like one, one fight to the next, that is what their relationship is like, one fight to the next. There's hardly a time where they're, they're, they're happy. One fight to the next, that is what their married life is like, but they'll still live together. Because what is more painful than, than a fight? The pain of being lonely. That is why old age seems like such a curse. That is why death is so fearful. Think about it. Just imagine your last moments of life. I know it's difficult because we've never been there. Or at least none of us have any recollection of it. But just ima try and imagine that situation, right? You know, once and for all, you're going to be left alone. 
There is nothing and no one that's going to be with you. You're going to be shut out from the rest of the world, right? And no one is going to be there to assure you that you exist. That is why death can be so fearful, so frightening. People who have fights all the time, you know, they'll still live together because just, you know, if you've got someone to fight with you all the time, argue with you, quarrel with you all the time, that is still, that is still an assurance that you exist, right? Because you can only fight with someone who's, always, who's there. That is better than departing and living alone. Old age can be so, so daunting because the thought of, oh, you know what, what old age will bring you. People start leaving you, your friends, your family, they start leaving you behind. Right? You, you're not invited to the parties anymore. You're not invited on trips anymore. Right? The children go away, they go and do their own thing. Right? Loneliness. Loneliness is, is really weighing down on today's, in today's society. It, it's becoming almost a pandemic. If you, you know, recent surveys that have been conducted on you know, people, particularly elderly people, right? if you, I, 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 I shared with you some stories from when I used to work in a, in a, in a nursing home, right? what bothered them was not having basic necessities. What bothered them was not having someone they could call theirs. What bothered them was not having someone who would be with them. Why, why do people stick themselves to a television set? Why do people listen to, I think we talked about this some time ago, when, when, you, when you have a breakup, and when you go through a ba- breakup, you listen to those songs we, which we you know, call boot songs, right? When you get the boot, <laughs> so you listen to those songs. Why do people listen to those songs? Because you feel that there is someone on the other side who speaks your language. They understand you. So they talk to your heart. So you feel like there's someone who acknowledges you. This acknowledgement is, is, a, is a severe desire of the mind. Acknowledgement. When you bump into someone, why do you think it's rude if they don't apologize? By mistake, you know, someone steps on your foot, someone bumps into you. Why do you think it's rude if they don't apologize? Because what does an apology give you? Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement that you are there, you exist. Don't be fooled, ladies and gentlemen. This sense or sensation, this perception of existence is something that has to be built in every chitta. It is not enough to do it in one chitta. See, right now you feel you exist, right? Don't be fooled. You're doing it with every chitta. With every chitta you're reminding yourself, I exist, I exist, I exist. And if a trillion chittas, if a billion chittas can run in the lapse of one second, in each and every one of those chittas, you're constantly reminding yourself that you exist. No wonder it is such an exhaustion. You're revving up your engine, always reminding, I exist. Fear not, I exist. You're doing it with every chitta. So therefore, you're constantly looking for assurances from around you that you exist. Just imagine if people at home, now, you know, you might have seen pranks that you know, people do on each other. They pretend that, that you, you are invisible. That in, I, I've seen in the past, you know, videos, little pranks that people play on each other. Like, say, people in the family, they all b- pretend that, say, the younger one, the little brother, that he doesn't exist. Right? So they just walk past him and he starts calling, Mom, Mommy, Dad, no one responds. They just ignore, completely ignore. How do you, what do you, what do you see or think would happen to them soon enough? They get really agitated, don't they? Just imagine that, right? Say the Anagarika Ram. You plan this out, right? And you just decide on one person and ignore them completely. Or maybe at at home, right? As Anagarika Mahat says, you can do that. Don't do it. But just imagine if you did that. You all you know, talked among yourselves and you make someone feel that they're completely invisible. 
that you ignore, you completely ignore them. They can tolerate hunger. They won't leave this place because they're hungry. They won't leave this place because they're thirsty. But they will if they feel that they're not acknowledged. Because it is a deep desire, a deep-rooted desire, the desire to be acknowledged. When you say, when you bid someone good morning, what do you expect them to say in return? Good morning, at least, morning. At least to give you a nod. Good morning, sir. At least that. But if you don't get a response, what do you normally say? How rude. Really what you're saying is, why don't they acknowledge me? Why don't they acknowledge me? You dress it up in all sorts of things, like that is impolite, that is rude, that is, you know, in social, that is, you know, etiquette, meeting etiquette, right? You, when you meet someone, you have to greet them. You dress it up in all these things, but the truth is, you just want to feel acknowledged. You can, you know, like, do a practical joke on someone by, by doing something like that and, and see how they feel. Maybe later on apologize to them because they would actually, you know, it can drive someone up the wall, honestly. Because the mind is always looking for assurance. That is why people have pets. You think it's only because they love animals? Not just because. It gives them acknowledgement. Because, you know, your pet dog, even when, you're, when your family or friends fall out, fall out with you, your pet dog, it has no reason to fall out with you, does it? And even if your dog falls out with you, there's, there's, you know, what about the, the fish in the tank? Because, you know, you can't fall out with them, with the fish, because you know, the fish don't know you, you don't know, you know the fish, but the fish doesn't know you, so there's no reason for you to fall out with it. But people stay there, look at the fish, right? And as it looks at you, you feel, you feel special. Like when you, when you pet an animal, or you rub its cheek, or you know, rub it rub under its ear, right? Or you give it a pet, and 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 like you know, your your pet, your kittens, your cats at home, and they, they just go and play, come and play with you, right? And rub themselves against your legs. How do you feel? You feel good because you feel acknowledged. The cat acknowledges that I exist. But it's it's not enough to rub your things against inanimate things because you know you know that this this is a material thing and it, and it can't acknowledge. You need that acknowledgement. That's why from time to time people say, you know, if you're a friend, give me a call once in a while. I haven't heard from you for, in a while. That's why, you know, it is, it is nice to call your friends from time to time. So you acknowledge them. When you ring them, they feel good. They feel good not just because you rang them. They feel good because they feel acknowledged. You have given them a place People need that place. People need to feel like someone. Every chitta wishes for that. To feel like someone. To feel that they are there. To feel that they exist. And because it is a, it is a gimmick that is played in every chitta, any help that can be received from the outside is a great support. Acknowledgement is a big thing. Just, you know, if you can take a memory, uh, walk down memory lane and just, you know, think of a situation where you felt ignored. See how uncomfortable you were? Maybe in your new school, that right, you're you going to a new school, right? There are people in the class, but, you know, they don't, they don't acknowledge you because you're the new guy, right? You feel very uncomfortable, right? Especially when you're in a new, in a new place. You don't feel acknowledged. If you don't feel acknowledged, you feel very uncomfortable. You want, to, you want to mix with everybody else. You want people to give you a place. And if, when you look around you, because everyone else is familiar to each, to each other, they get a, a better place than you. They get more acknowledgement than you, and that is unsettling. This is a social disease. We, we like to feel companionship. This is not a problem in Arahant has. The desire to be acknowledged. So this is where loneliness comes out of. 
when you have no one to acknowledge you, when you have no one that recognizes your existence, when you don't receive support from the people around you that you exist, now loneliness begins to bother you. In moments of loneliness, where you might feel this way, I want you to remember the talk that we had today. Because there will be moments where you feel that way. Today, the day and age, we have these electronic devices that we carry in our hands that helps us to, be, to remain connected with the outside. Why, does, why do people need to be connected? What is, you know, when, when, when people say connected, what does that mean? Connected with what? To someone else. Why are people constantly checking their messages? Hmm? Exactly. Even when they know that not, you know, there's not been a message, they'll still pick up their phone and check any messages, any, you know, WhatsApp, any Facebook messages, any SMS, missed calls. Just the sight of it is enough to excite you. Now, scientists have done research and said, you know, just the sight, just a tick, tick is enough to get the dopamine running in your body. Those triggers the feel-good hormones, because what you have received is an acknowledgement. In some countries, ladies and gentlemen, because people are now far too busy to, to give up time for somebody else, you know, you can hire a friend. You can hire a friend now. So, you can, you know, like you hire a taxi, right? You just go online and they you can pick a friend and you can just uh, pay them online and then they'll come and spend the day with you. Oh, and by the way, the deal is they don't have to talk with you. You don't have to talk with them. So there can be, a, you know, that, that whole time that they spend with you, you can be, you can you know, just be silent, but they're there to acknowledge you. So they'll walk with you, they'll eat with you, They'll go to the store with you, right? They'll just be there. Sometimes they won't speak a word because you don't have to speak a word. You can pay with your phone, right? Tap. <laughs> you can do all that. But what, what, what are people paying for then? Acknowledgement. Have that companionship to be assured that I exist. Because if everyone around, else around you doesn't acknowledge you, then do you really exist? It's like, you know, why do we have a piece of paper that says you're married? What is marriage after all? It's a convention, right? You have to make believe all the while that you are married. That is why you need a piece of paper to prove it. In the same way, in every chitta, you have to make believe that you exist. And for that, for that, for that, for that goal to be achieved, any support you can get from the outside, where people acknowledge you, right, helps. Every little helps. So whenever you see someone lonely, it is said, you know, if don't make your friends feel lonely, go and talk to them. If there's a new guy in class, you know, a new boy in class, a new girl in class, right? The, 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 more, the more kind among you, the more compassionate among you, will generally have been the person who would always go and talk to them make them feel, you know, part of the group, right? Make them feel welcome. Yeah? And, and, and for that, they would have been ever so grateful. Perhaps your best friend was the person you went and welcomed into your class, and then you went, ended up becoming their best friend, because in those moments, that was their deepest vexation, not feeling acknowledged. Just imagine, right? Say, now, today you have the alms giving, later on, right? you'll be in the Dhamma hall, and our monks will walk up to you with their alms bowls, right? So you can offer a handful. Just imagine, say you are sat in a row of five people. Okay, you are number three. Okay? A Swami Mahanse brings their alms bowl, stops at number one, stops at number two, skips you, and walks to number four. How would you feel? Hmm? How would you feel? 
you'll feel terrible. You'll feel you have not been acknowledged. They don't need to know you. Right? You, you don't know them by name, they don't know you by name. This is perhaps the first time you've seen them and, and vice versa. But you feel acknowledged now. Why is it considered good manners, right? When someone's in the room, right, and everyone's got somewhere to sit, but someone walks in and there's nowhere to sit. Why is it considered good manners to speak to them and offer them a chair? Because you acknowledge them. Why when you're late to a meeting, right, you've got to go back to them and say, hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to be late for a meeting, please give me 10 minutes, I'll come back to you. Yes, you know, we have to be careful with other people's time and so on, but the desire to be acknowledged is far greater to be acknowledged. You know, a lot of these, these, you know, these rules of etiquette about good manners and those things, right, they're, they're all part of that. Saying, you know, wishing someone, uh, saying someone good morning, uh, or, or, or saying thank you, saying please, saying sorry, all of these things, right, they, they are rooted in man's desire to feel acknowledged. So people have pets at home because they feel acknowledged. Someone showed me the other day, um, in, in some, I think it was in, in Japan, uh, people, sometimes they have, you know, a lot of people who, who leave other countries like us, you know, for studies and so on, they go over there and settle down and try to, you know, make a living for themselves. So sometimes they, they, they first start out in a, in a small studio, right, because that is all they can afford perhaps. Or maybe they're they're saving up for something 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 greater. And so there was a there was this girl. She was about, I think, in her late twenties, early thirties. She lives by herself, but for her pet dog. So she has no other friends. She's no other family, but she has a pet dog. And she she's delighted by the fact that when she gets home. The dog is there to wag its tail and say what? I acknowledge you. That is what she's happy about. And she says it. I'm, you know, when I come home, you know, whatever name, I can't remember now, you know, he welcomes me. See, acknowledgement. So whenever you feel lonely, if there are times where you feel lonely, and there will be, like death, is the final, the ultimate loneliness. That is the ultimate loneliness if, not, if you don't prepare yourself for it. So this is, you know, good advice, better come now rather than later. Right? Prepare yourself while there is, you know, while the, the sun is still shining. Prepare yourself for it. When, you, when that moment comes where you feel that everyone is leaving you out, you are now shutting down the fear that will creep into your mind is the fear of loneliness. That is why death is so painful. It is not the physical pain. It is not the physical pain. It is the fear of loneliness. The fear of assurance, the fear of acknowledgement that you exist. Because you get a lot of support from the outside. When you get home and you have your children with you, don't you want them to come and hug you? Because as a mother, you want to feel acknowledged. For your birthday, don't you want someone to give you a card? A birthday card? If you, you know, like a present. You know, there's one way you can really tease someone, right? It's their birthday and you have no presents. Wouldn't that be the best teaser you can give someone? I, uh, you know, people play pranks with these things. Like it's Christmas, there's a Christmas tree and there's a, there's a, there's a present for everyone in the family but one. So maybe the little daughter, the young girl at home, she comes, where's my present? Oh, we forgot you. And then what happens next? She throws a tantrum, right? Why? What was she not? Acknowledged. She was not acknowledged. Her presence was not acknowledged. It is deep-rooted in the human mind, the desire to be acknowledged. The desire for others to accept that I am. That's the sentence. I am. I exist. 
all this uh, curses of jati. It's funny because Guru Handra was telling me the other day, he, um, he said one of the reasons why old age, because we were somewhere and he was he was pointing to me at pointing to me at some people who are elderly and they were almost near the you know the end of their life and he's saying you know, the the biggest fear that these people have is the fear of loneliness and it's true as you grow older right you become less and less valuable to society have you not seen how old people talk a lot about their past now this is not a generalization and I don't mean to offend anyone so but please allow me to speak freely for the purpose of uh, the Dhamma if, you, if you've seen you know, some, some old people they, they talk a lot they talk about their past they talk about how they were the things they used to do and they do that because it gives them value what they're saying is, you know, I did this, I did that, I did all these things, acknowledge me. Don't just ignore me, acknowledge me. When I was younger, I used to do this. When I was, you know, when I was in my teenage years, I used to do this. I have this experience first had when I was at the, at the, at the uh, nursing home. You know, a lot of the old people there used to talk about their, their, their children. They used to talk about their work. They used to talk about their, their household lives. They used to talk about a lot of the things that they do. You know, sometimes you say, old people, they just don't shut up. <laughs> you, you've experienced this, perhaps, when you're with people like that, because they just want to keep on talking. Why? They want to keep you engaged in a conversation. This is not an insult to them. This is just a warning to all of you. They keep on talking to keep you engaged for fear that if they have no conversation to have with you, you will walk away. So to keep you interested, they'll just keep on talking about their past. I used to do this, I used to do that. And one of the best ways to keep you know, uh, older people alive, for need of a better word, is to go and talk to them. You know, it's often said, right, you know, for older people, what they want is someone to talk to. Why? Just think about it. Why? Because when they're younger, there are other things that you can get from them. You can get them, you can get their help, you can get their support. You know, they're youthful, they're energetic, they can do things for you. But when you're older, you know, you become the trash, the trash of society. You know, like the tissue paper, right? Used and then just discarded. Because once you're of no use to others and you're just a weight and a burden, then people are quite happy to discard you. So, when you get to that point, if you haven't prepared yourselves, have you not seen how sometimes when there's a couple, right, man and woman, especially if, the, if the, say, their children have left them and now it's just the two of them to keep each other company, when one goes, complete the sentence for me, soon enough, the other follows. What's the magic? Lack of acknowledgement. Because when one's there, even if they're paralyzed, the other partner, right? Even if the, if, even if the husband or the wife is paralyzed and they can't do anything more than just blink their eyes perhaps, even that itself is an acknowledgement. They know that I'm here, even if nobody else does. In an ocean of nothingness and nobody, I am a somebody because someone acknowledges me. That's why people keep pets. I won't say that's the only reason people keep pets, but that's a big reason why people keep pets. The desire to be acknowledged, so that they don't feel lonely. So, you know, why am I sharing this with you? Identify if you have this trait. If your mind still seeks acknowledgement, if your mind still looks for confirmation of your existence. 
look within and see if those defilements still lay dormant in your mind and fight with them because one day you're going to be helpless in the face of loneliness because there is nothing we'll be able to do or anyone else will be able to do to stop you from feeling lonely most love songs are about loneliness especially those so, so called boot songs that is about loneliness they, you know if you listen or read to some of the lyrics of these songs it talks about how now they have no one to care about them no one to think about them no one to be with no one to hold a hand with no one to no one to look at them no one to talk to them no one to smile with them no one to share a laughter or a tear with them right no one to do that with no acknowledgement when someone calls you and you miss a call what do they expect you to do bring them back if you don't what do they ask you how many times did i call you why didn't you ring me back meaning why did you not acknowledge me how rude the desire to be acknowledged is a great one so one thing you can really do for people out of compassion is one help them to free themselves from this desire to be acknowledged but two acknowledge them that is why you know i've been sharing with you in the past and i'm sure you know you do this all the time when you go to a store someone helps you you know use their name that is one way in which you can really acknowledge them because there is no there are no two people by the same name so when you use someone's name they know for sure that it is they you have acknowledged instead of just saying thank you thank you sam that one word is a huge acknowledgement of their soul of their existence of their atman yesterday one of our young monks came and asked me he said swami nanda i have no experience of a breakup what does that feel like <laughs> oh bless him right <laughs> he came because he he came to us as an anagarik and ordained at at a at a naive young age <laughs> so he's never experienced what a breakup is you know what a breakup is buddha you do <laughs> i don't think you know what i mean by a breakup then <laughs> so he's asking me so i mean what does a breakup feel like because people say that it's 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 torturous and it really you know it, it's it's so it feels so heavy on the heart and it feels almost like you're going to have a heart attack what does it actually feel like so of course you know i can't give him the feeling of what a breakup feels like you know it's not something i can like yeah here you go that's what it feels like but we just had a brief conversation about why breakups are so so terrible why they're so difficult to to handle to stomach to overcome and you know this might be a good <laughs> good therapy <laughs> for for some of you in the room perhaps or maybe those listening to these talks online maybe someone needs this needs to hear this perhaps breakups why breakups are so so difficult to to bear why they're so difficult so i asked him why do you feel bad when you why do you why do you you know when you, i asked him about an ice cream i said you know if you had an ice cream in your hand and you start eating it right you start lapping it up right what do you feel when it runs out he says well when it runs out i and for the time being i'm okay but then after that i look for the next lap so it's it's never ending right one lap leads to the next to the next to the next and when it ends you know soon enough i'll be looking for another one when you listen to a, a piece of music what do you do you listen to it and if it feels good you want it again right when you watch something and you enjoy it if you like it what do you do you watch it again So I said now I'm trying to explain to him what a breakup feels like and by using examples that he knows so he's never had a breakup so I can't give him that feeling so I said 
So, you know, those are all breakups as well. When you run out of something that you really like, when you run out of ice cream and you want some, that's a breakup. When you run out of music but you still want to listen to it, that's a breakup. But the breakup of a relationship is far more severe because when you run out of ice cream, it's just one of your senses, one or two of your senses that you are no longer able to please. But you have your other senses that are constantly feeding your mind. But a relationship is very different to that. Because a relationship, like a papana, feeds all five senses. And most of all, it feeds the soul. Because in a relationship, you receive acknowledgement that you exist. That could be a friend. It could be a loved one. Right? See, what's the difference between a friend and a loved one? A friend can be yours and somebody else's as well, right? But a loved one? Whose are they exclusively? Hmm? Yours. So their very, you know, their whole existence, their whole existence affirms your existence. That is why breakups are so difficult to bear. When there's someone in this world who, who, who claims to exist on your behalf, you know, that's, you know, these things can be so addictive. Some people are addicted to, to, to those relationships so much so that if, some, if there's a breakup, they go and commit suicide. They can't, they can't bear the loss. But I don't think anyone's committed suicide because they ran out of ice cream. But a breakup? Not so easy to bear. Because what they give you is acknowledgement. They give you exclusive acknowledgement. Even if there's no one else who acknowledges you. Uh, you in just the way you are. Your weaknesses, your strengths, your flaws, everything. You as a package, they acknowledge, they accept that. And that's, that's, that's a big thing. Someone who accepts me as I am. Because every part of me is me, right? Every part of me is me. A friend may only know you in, in, a, in a few ways, but you know, when you're in, a, in that kind of relationship, like they know you inside out, metaphorically speaking. They know you inside out. So for someone who acknowledges you inside out, you know, that is one heck of an acknowledgement. So that is why relationships are so difficult to bear when you have a breakup. See, when it happens to you, it'll be too late for, for me to share these things with you. Like I said, with loneliness, you know, when, when that ultimate loneliness comes to you, it might be too late. But that is why it is better to be prepared for that journey up ahead. Be that a friend you break up, or a, or a special friend, right, or a loved one. Right? All these relationship breakups are so painful because you lose that sense of acknowledgement that you get from them. That is why even you know, when people say, right, I have learned my lesson, never again. Two weeks later? <laughs> and sometimes people get divorced and they, say, and they swear, never again. Hmm? Sometimes a few months later, they're back in a relationship. It's complicated. That's a relationship status nowadays, isn't it? In a relationship, not a single, married. It's complicated. They want to commit, but not sure. Because they want... What is this commitment? Commitment to acknowledgement. I want someone to commit themselves to me, meaning I want someone to acknowledge me wholly. In other words, you know, what you want someone to do is to, is to think about how you feel. That is what you want someone to do. Think about how you feel. That is what you're looking for. You want someone to think about how you feel, to acknowledge how you feel. That is why if they have, or if you at least you suspect that they have another relationship, it bothers you. Even if it's not another relationship, but 
that proximity, that closeness that you have, that special bond you have with someone, if they, if they show the slightest of signs that they might have something like that with somebody else, not a relationship, just that special, special bond. Right? Maybe they, the, the, the smile or the laugh that you get, some, they give to somebody else as well. Right? Maybe that closeness, that special hug that you think is only yours, they give to somebody else as well. Don't you like for someone in this world to have to treat you, just you, you and just you, in certain ways? Don't you like for your loved one to have a special hug just for you? Just think, this is far too embarrassing for this conversation. <laughs> Don't give me any nods, I'll just keep on saying, right? It's fine, you don't have to give me any nods, you just accept it if it is true or reject it if it's not. I'm just talking about the human soul, right? How the mind works. I think about it, like, you know, just take a friend for instance. There are special words that you want your friend, your best friend to only use with you. Think about why. Why does that make you feel special? Why do you want to made, be made? Why do you want to be... Oh, say that again. Why do you want to... be... made to feel special? Thank you. Why do you want to be made to be... Blah, 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 that one. <laughs> Why do you want to be made to feel special? What is all this about specialness? Why special? Why do you want to feel special? Why do you want to have a special one? Why is that? Why a special friend? Why, why look for a best friend? Why is it not enough to just have a friend? Why a special friend? Why a best friend? Because in a best friend, what do you seek? Special treatment. Meaning, treat me like you treat nobody else. What does that give you? Acknowledgement that you are unique. See, if you are always seeking for this acknowledgement, if you're always seeking for assurances, if you're always seeking for affirmation that you are unique, are you so unique then? If every chitta, every living moment you need to constantly be, be fed assurances, affirmations that you are unique, are you unique then? Of course not. That is why you have to constantly be, be kept feeding that or be, or, or be fed that. Because you are not unique. And that is why when, as I said, you know, have, you're in a relationship and they start showing that special, you know, those special connections, maybe a smile that you think is only yours, if they smile that smile with somebody else, you have a problem with that. Why are you smiling with him like you smile with me? Oh, of course, you'll ask that question. Why do you look at him like that? I thought that look was just for me. Let's imagine, you know, they, they make something nice for you. Right? <laughs> Say they, they, they bake a cake for you or something. They've made something, something special. Okay? Maybe they've made it for the first time on your anniversary. Hmm? And now, of course, you're very happy about that. That they've made something very special for you. You know, deep down in your, in your heart, there's, a, there's, there's an unspoken wish. Sometimes you, you find it too embarrassing to even spit it out. But you wish, you hope and you pray that you are the only one who's ever going to be a recipient of that. It is an unspoken wish. Sometimes you might, you might suggest it. Hmm? Like with things like, oh how nice it is to know that I'm the only one in the world who's going to be able to eat that made by your hands. What are you suggesting? Then this is exclusively for me. Acknowledgement. 
It gives you such pleasure to know that there is someone out there. And it doesn't have to be that particular person because once they leave, somebody else will come and take their seat and then that, that, that day on, you want them to acknowledge that you are the only one. What about jealousy? Think about what jealousy is. See, what we are doing here is we are analyzing all these defilements through the lens of Dhamma. That's what we are doing here. We are taking it to the surgical table, cutting it, slicing it, dicing it, and having a look at what does that entail? What is, what is jealousy? What is jealousy? What is jealousy? Really? We know it's vicious, we know it's, a, it's, it's vile, but what is jealousy? You feel jealous when you don't get that exclusive acknowledgement. I'm talking one, about one aspect of jealousy. When someone gives you something and you think that you're, you're the only recipient of that and you see that it is given to somebody else, now you feel jealous. Take children in the family, for instance. Now, you know, a, a, a good piece of advice that parents are given often is, if you have two or three children at home, treat everyone the same, right? Mothers, fathers in the house, you know what I'm talking about. This is advice that you would have been given. Because if you, if, you, if you tend to show more love or affection towards one child than the other, right? soon enough what will happen? They start feeling jealous. If there are parents here who have had more than one child, you know what I'm talking about. At some point it will start to surface. If you fix it soon enough, it's fine. But have you not heard them come and tell you, Ammi loves Ayya more than me, no? Then you have to, you have to, no, but the Ammi is not like that. Ammi loves you both the same. No, but once that's seated in their mind, it's very difficult to un unroot it or uproot it. Once it settles, it's in there. It's all a drushti. <laughs> Taking that out is not going to be easy after that. This is a desire to be acknowledged. See, especially siblings at home, you know, they're always on the lookout. They're born with this. You know, this desire to be acknowledged. You know, human beings, we are born with it. Because this is the nature of, this is a, a consequence of jati. You're born with it. <clears throat> if, you, if you are a sibling, right, if you've had a brother or a sister at home, you know what I'm talking about. There will have been moments in your family where you felt that the other one received more love than you did. There would have been times where that had happened. And that made you feel terrible. You felt neglected. That loneliness, you know, you'd be willing to give up anything for that. You'd be willing to sacrifice anything for that. Just to feel acknowledged. So, you know, it is, it is, you know, it is okay. You know, make sure you, you, you try and give all your children the same love. But I think the only remedy for it is to teach them why they feel that way as soon as they can possibly start learning these things. Maybe if they're still too young, you know, soon enough try and explain to them, you know, this is why the mind feels this way and so on. Otherwise, you know, it can, it can grow into something monstrous, Sometimes they start, you know, just a little crack in that relationship. You know, between two brothers maybe, maybe brother and sister, it will just start off as a little crack. But that crack will widen as the years pass on, right? And if they, if they continue, because, you know, this is a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you feel that you are the less loved one, as you start to look through that lens, you will start seeing evidence to it. Yeah, because the mind will see what it wants to see. It's terrible, these tricks that the mind likes to play it on itself. The mind will see what it wants to see. And then those, those cracks will start to widen. And then after a while, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, they'll always see it that way. The, 
there's there's not there's hardly anything you can do as as parents you know other than trying to give every all your children love the same way there's not really much you can do but the real remedy for this is to give them the dhamma and then after a while you know they'll they'll grow up and go on to become teenagers right and then that split will really start to show it will go from being a small split to a, a fissure that is so wide a gap that you can't merge again and then the two siblings will split and forever long they will keep that they will harbor it in the back of their minds from time to time it will crop up from time to time they'll start saying things it will always be there in the back of their minds that is why you know if you love your children ladies and gentlemen you have to give them the dhamma i can't i can't think of parental love to children that does not include the dhamma it is not complete you can feed your child you can breastfeed your child right you can you can you can give them the best education you can give them every comfort in life but if you don't give them the milk of dhamma it is just a problem waiting to happen now as you know as i always compliment parents who bring their children ch- children here children who bring their children here from time to time at least it's great that you do that only the dhamma heals dhamma bhave rakati dhamma chari nothing else this is this desire to feel acknowledged in a group you f- you want the desire you have the desire to desire to feel acknowledged if you're having a conversation in a group and you're not involved now usually if there's a chair chairperson in a group you know it is good usually the chairperson of a group is encouraged to get the voices of people who don't engage in a conversation heard right less they feel that they are not acknowledged because here's what will happen next if they don't feel that they're getting they they being engaged in that conversation today's friend is can be tomorrow's foe when they don't feel like their voice is being heard right they will start to dissent they will be the dissenting voice and soon enough there's no longer angel but rather demon but in this guys they will start to be the one who will start breaking the team apart so it's important you know these things we have to learn so that we know how to live in society but what we're doing here is really you know understanding these defilements these human weaknesses human you know mental cankers through the light of dhamma that is what jealousy is the desire to be acknowledged when you take a photograph what do you look at first yourself the desire to be acknowledged when someone says right here are the names of those and something right let's say i i i started reading out the names of those who will be who are present here today hmm unbeknown to you there's a, there's a desire somewhere perhaps my name will be read at the top maybe my name will be read out first and if it's much lower down in the list it doesn't feel the same because acknowledgement you look for now we don't have it here at our monastery because our monks don't get to choose that right it is all decided by the senior monks that like when we go for higher ordination it is our teacher who decides what order in which the order in which we we receive our, our, our higher ordination by i suppose in other places you know it is determined by your order in which you ordained but at our monastery it is not so because we look at what service we can they can render to the sasana and that is true. it is that we used to decide the 
the order in which they receive their higher ordination. And the same will go for your programs. The Sila Shravika programs, Shravika programs. Now in these ones, you know, we have just chosen uh, a simple process. You know, the first to request is the first in line. Why? So that when you question, we have a simple get out, get out close answer. Because it can, it can, be, it can be difficult to bear. Initially, later on, you know, it, you realize this, this whole nonsense is just a, you know, just, a, just a foolery of the mind. You realize that soon enough. But initially, you know, we have to be very careful as we, as we, as we begin to train them. But in the sasana, after you become a monk, right, and the order in which our young anagarikas are ordained, now we'll have an ordination ceremony soon enough coming up, and, and the order in which they are ordained is not determined by the date they came in here. It is determined by their teachers, based on service to the sasana. Acknowledgement plays a big part there. Pride, ego, that is a killer. It's easy to heal. Desire and aversion is very difficult to heal delusion. Raga and Dvesha are easier targets. They're easier. But delusion, moha, is a far more difficult target because it always escapes you. In fact, it is you. That is why it's difficult to heal. Because when you have raga, right, it feels like you have raga, right? When you have dvesha, it feels like you have dvesha. But when you have moha, you are moha. That is why it's difficult to heal. It doesn't. It never feels like you have you. <laughs> it, you are you. But it feels like you have lust, you have desire, you have anger. Don't you? That's how it feels. I have jealousy, you know, I have... I have, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, greed, right? These, you feel that these are sort of things that are fixed to you and you can take them off one by one. But when it comes to pride, when it comes to ego, that is you. That is why it's difficult to shake that off. One of the toughest nuts to crack, if not the most. That is why you have to be a, pra- a, a mat to a mat. That is why that is so important, to be a mat to a mat. At least aspire for that. And one of the best ways to handle these situations is to let someone else decide. When it comes to things in life, let someone else decide. Guru Hanu sometimes says, just toss a coin. If you, can't de- if you have to be the one to decide, toss a coin. Let the coin decide. And then when it falls, and you, it's fallen head, and you, st- you want tails, flip it round. Huh? No, of course not. <laughs> Give yourself up. Give up your preference. Try to convince yourself that you have no place or part to play. Succumb. Surrender. I know this is easier said than done. And you know, these might just seem, sound like words to you. I'm talking about I'm, I'm, you know, in these words, I'm trying to explain to you an internal transformation. Succumb is just one word. But what I mean is something so revolutionary. I'm talking about you going against yourself. The toughest thing to do. To surrender is you going against yourself. So catch yourself initially where you feel that you are looking for acknowledgement. Whether it is to come first in class, or if you take pride in being last in class. Sometimes it can come in that way. 
Sometimes you stand at the back of the queue so that you can say, I'm the one who's always at the back of the queue. I am the one. I am the one who is always late. If that is far too much of an embarrassment, I am the one who is always on time. Your efforts and attempts to be the one will surface from time to time and you must catch yourself when you try and do that. I am the good one. I am the bad one. Sometimes, sometimes people don't want to shed their evilness because it is part of their identity. They want to be known as the, the village thug. I, they know that this is bad, they know that this is terrible and they, but they, and they want to move on but they can't because it is now part of their identity. That is what gives them uniqueness, it gives them acknowledgement. See, don't you think the man, like I remember reading this book in, uh, I think it's in How to Win Friends and Influence People. The book starts off with a story about a criminal, right? He was a, he was a serial killer, a serial killer who wanted acknowledgement a serial killer who wanted acknowledgement that he was the most dangerous criminal that was there in his time. He wanted that acknowledgement. He didn't want to let go of that. Because, you know, just imagine that, you know, if you have mug shots of you <laughs> everywhere, right, people are talking about you, like they, they fear you. Yeah, fear is again an acknowledgement, right? People are so weak. Now, in, I remember when, in, in my school days, right, sometimes there would be thugs in school, like, you know, fellow students, right, but they would pretend to be thugs. Every school has a school thug, right? I don't think it's just a, a phenomenon in boys' schools. I think girls' schools also, they have a the school thug. No? No? The, the, the one who shouldn't be messed with, there's a thug. Maybe not in your days, but it is there now. <laughs> and, and just think about, you know, that is their way for make that is their way of making up for their own weaknesses. They what they're looking for is acknowledgement. So do we have animosity towards them or do we should we have sympathy towards them? They're looking for acknowledgement. Because if they can't shine for their strengths, if they can't be known for their talents or their skills, now they have to be known for something. So they'll be known to be the one who always bothers other people. The class clown. There's always a class clown. That if they can't be known for their studiousness, if they can't be known for being, being on, on time, being punctual, if they can't be known for, the, for, for being the one who is, who is number one in math, they want to be known as a class clown at least. They're seeking acknowledgement. So, you know, teachers, if there are teachers here among you, all teachers, huh? <laughs> Have sympathy. Don't immediately think that what they're trying to do is disrupt the class because they're doing it out of spite. They're not doing it out of spite, they're doing it out of helplessness. Have pity. They're looking for acknowledgement. Sometimes, you know, there are some, some place, young boys, you know, they'll always get into fights. What they're looking for is acknowledgement. Sometimes they'll pretend to, <clears throat> they'll pretend to, to have uh, uh, certain traits, maybe certain behaviors. Looking for acknowledgement. They just want to be acknowledged. We all have it more or less. But as you grow up, you learn to contain yourself. You learn to control it. But when you're younger, it's far more difficult to do that. Because that is, that is a vexation that you have in your mind. And you don't realize that in society, we don't just relieve ourselves from vexations. We have to learn to control them and contain them. That we learn as we mature. But young children, they don't, they don't always have this, this idea. So, when you see that, just acknowledge them. That can be the best remedy in those situations. If there's someone who's always shouting in class, or, you know, I'm talking to teachers, right? If they're shouting in class, or, you know, maybe if there's a sibling who's always 
fighting or just, you know, they're just not doing their homework. Maybe, you know, if you start seeing these behavioral patterns, perhaps they're starting to feel jealous. Maybe you've got a newcomer to the family. Sometimes, you know, especially this can happen like, you've, you, you know, there's a new newcomer in the family, a, a new baby. Right? In those days, those few weeks, months, until they learn to adjust themselves to the, to the newcomer in the family, yeah, they're going to start showing strange behaviors, behaviors that you will not have seen before. What they're looking for is most likely acknowledgement. Because now they feel threatened that the place that they had is now, is now lost because all attention is now focused on the, on the new child. Because whenever visitors come now, where do they go? When auntie comes, those days they used to come and give me chocolate, give me cake, give me a hug. But now, Nangis come. Hmm? Now where do the visitors go? Where does auntie go now? She, she wants to go and see the, see, the new, see the baby. So, where is my place now at home? Where is my place? <coughs> acknowledgement. That is what they seek. Acknowledgement. This is a consequence of jati. It is looking for assurance that I exist. It is looking to gather evidence that I exist. So, spot this, this characteristic, this trait in yourselves, as well as where you see it in others, and have sympathy, both towards them and yourselves. This is what we call Hitanukampa. Anukampa is sympathy or empathy. Hita is the chitta, the mind. Compassion or empathy towards the mind, not towards anyone, but a mind. Which mind? Exactly. It's the mind. The mind that is ridden by jati. A mind that is stricken by jati. Have compassion. See, all we're, trying to, all we're learning to do here, folks, is you know, to, to live our normal lives, but just look at things from a different perspective. That is what we're doing here. That is the training that we receive here. It is just your ditti that has, to, that has to change. And then go and explore the world as you normally do. Live, live in this world as you normally do. Just, just take a different perspective to it. All these defilements, all these cankers and... Weaknesses that, 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 that ail the human mind. I just want you to take a different perspective on it. And then the more you do, you're able to do that, the more you look at it through metta, karuna, mudita and upeksha. And no longer with anger. And so, you know, someone comes and asks you for love. It is not love that you need to give them. I'm not talking about noble love. I'm talking about sensual love, not just general worldly love. When someone asks you for love, it is not love you need to give them. What you need to have is empathy. Give them loving kindness. Recognize that this is an ailing mind. Recognize that they're looking for acknowledgement. So when someone wants to pick a fight with you, recognize that they're looking for acknowledgement. Even by picking a fight, they're looking for acknowledgement. Sometimes their body has to pay the price, but the mind receives acknowledgement. Recognize that. Be a sage. Have a, a broad view on things, a much broader view on things. Broaden your horizons. And that is what the Dhamma will help you do. Broaden your horizons, where you can look at almost everything from a more equanimous point of view. That is why it is important for you to settle yourself down first before you try and help others. Where your, you know, your comfort zones stretch out infinitely so that anything is okay. When your comfort zones are very small, only very few things, very few people, very few behaviors and traits can fit into it. 
But as you practice the Dhamma, your, broadens, your, your, your horizons broaden, right? And these comfort zones, they, they keep on expanding. They keep on expanding until you can accept and acknowledge pretty much everything. Anything, any weakness, any flaw that you see in human behavior, you begin to understand that this is just, this is just an ailing mind. We must learn to hate only the sin, but not the sinner. Hate only the sin. Where you have to deal with people and you find that they, are, they have certain behaviors or traits and characteristics that you don't, you don't approve of, you, 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 you don't condone, right? in those moments take, take, a, take a deep breath and remind yourself of the Dhamma that we talk about here. Is it them or is it something that is happening to them? There's a difference. If you identify that weakness as an individual, now they are your enemy. But if you identify the weakness as the weakness and not the person, not the chitta, not that mind, then your problem is now with, the, with, that, with that weakness, with that defilement. So then you can work together in your fight against it. Now I realize, you know, these are words that I, I'm trying to convey to you, but these words will only have power when you put it into action. Put it into action and you will realize the power that these words have. It is only those who put it into action who will realize the power that these words have. I share with you because it is what I do. It is what I practice. I'm not, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not going to be the one to say that I have perfected it, but I'm practicing it. But I know that to the extent to which I have practiced it, that is to the extent to which I feel free. I invite you to do the same. Make use of the Dhamma to help you to make that jump. Face those challenges. That is what the Dhamma is for. It's, you know, just like food is to be eaten, like water is to be drunk, Dhamma is to help you overcome these challenges. It is not simply, you know, food is not to be cooked it, 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 you cook it, but it's not. You don't cook for the for the sake of cooking. You cook it so you can eat it, right? In the same way, the dhamma is not just to be learned for the sake of learning. The dhamma is learned so that you can heal an ailing mind. That is what it is for. The dhamma that is not applied means nothing to you. Absolutely nothing. And I know you are practicing it because you know that is the evidence that you carry on your shoulders. It, you know it is it is a big leap. Whatever leap you've made, whatever jump you've made, well done. Continue on that path. Never turn back now that you've started. Never turn back. Until it is done, don't turn back. Only turn back to count your successes, to see how far you have come. And from time to time to remind yourself that it was all worth it. Right? And to see those who have helped you on the way here as well as to encourage them to, to go on the same journey that you have come. For that purpose, you can turn back, that's fine. But don't literally turn back and start walking the other way, because if you've come this far, you're closer by that much to your destination. If you go back and start again, don't forget that you have to make that same trek all over again. In all this that we do, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one ultimate ambition, one ultimate goal. Be it may that we, have, we all come from different walks of life, be it may that we've done all sorts of different things, we've been up to all sorts of different things, but our paths converge at one point. Just like this, Vatapata. Our paths converge. See, we all start in different places, but our paths converge. No matter where you come from, your destination is the same. Some of these Vatapatas, they come with you know, various decorations on the sides, right? the, outer, the outer borders. They come very colorful. Some of them are very elaborate. 
in ornate colors they come, just like, you know, the variety with which you come here. But once you jump that, you come to the same path, white, as we are, united, we are the same, we resemble the same thing. And then all parts, like ekayano, ayambikkave, maggo, satta, nam, vishuddhya, soka, paridhavana, samatikka, maya, dukkha, domanasa, nangatanga, maya, Nyayasa adhigamaya, nibbana sachikiriyaya, yadijan chattaru satipatta. There's only one path to liberation. No matter where you start, you must all converge on the same point. So in the same way, if you've started this journey and you've come halfway, you've come a third of the way, you've come an eighth of the way, don't turn back now. Because by that much you are closer to your destination. If you turn back now, you will someday have to make that journey again. There's no question about that. I speak to those not just here, but also those who are listening to these talks online. Because I know there are those who want to come and join our, our army. And there, perhaps some of you are trying to overcome the obstacles, the hurdles, the challenges that you have in your home lives. And oftentimes we get, you hear stories of young men, young women, who wish to make this jump, but of course, you know, like it was for all of us, there will always have been obstacles and challenges. That is, the, that is by very nature the way. Right? Anything we've done to hinder someone from going on that path to Nibbana will come and hinder us again when it's our turn to do so. That is why even if it's not for you, don't ever pull someone back when it is their turn to make that journey. Because when you decide that you want to do it, then the consequences of your actions you will begin to feel then. So if someone wishes to make that journey, let them. Don't hold them back. One day you will regret. One day you will. There may be some among you here. You want to make that jump, but it's impossible. Almost impossible. Maybe your family is against that idea. Maybe your circumstances defy you. Right? Perhaps consequences of previous actions. Most likely. So, don't make the same mistake twice. We all converge on the same path, on the same destination. And that is our ultimate bliss. So for that, we make use of the Dhamma. Nothing more. So we talked about, what did we talk about? Loneliness. Thank you. And acknowledgement, right? Yes. Thank you for acknowledging me, sir. Acknowledgement. So identify those moments in which you feel that way. Identify when you, you see other people behave in those ways where what they look for is acknowledgement and give them that. Just give them that. Just give them a bit of acknowledgement. Give them a nod. Give them a shake. Right? Shake their hand. Say hello. Just give them a smile. That is why a smile is such a powerful force. Because with a smile, what do you do? You acknowledge. You acknowledge. It's a simple gesture, but a very powerful one. You acknowledge. And arahants don't require your smile, because they don't need acknowledgement. Because they are not constantly trying to convince themselves that they exist. <laughs> But a mind on this side of the fence is always trying to convince themselves that they exist and for that any evidence is good. Is any evidence is supportive. So whenever you can give them that acknowledgement so that they will be free of their vexation, but and that will be a path for you to for them to acknowledge you in return, and through your acknowledgement you will be able to invite them to a, a better future, to a better path, a better solution a better journey, a better destination, which is the journey that you have all come on. So, aspiring for that, once again I want to congratulate all of you, because it's nice to see so many prayer mats on shoulders, such a delightful image to see so many prayer mats on shoulders.
It's your acknowledgement of the Noble Triple Gem. It's your acknowledgement of the Sambuddha Sasana. It is your investiture of the Sambuddha Sasana. It is your coronation of the Sambuddha Sasana. That is your throne. It is your crown. Wear it with pride. And invite and encourage others to join your ranks. Help them and support them because you know you've come here not because there was nothing better to do but because this was the only thing that was worth doing. So I salute you and congratulate you and wish you all the best on your journey forwards and towards the ultimate destination. And that brings us to the end of the time we have for today. Looking forward to another meeting next week. I bid you farewell. Right, let us transfer the merits and bring today's talk to a close. First and foremost then, let us all remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching. And with immense gratitude towards the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, who since time immemorial have protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha, let us transfer these merits to them for protecting and preserving the teachings and in transferring to, to us in the form of the Sripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, who live throughout the world and all members of the Maha Sangha who practice the path to achieve their liberation. Let us transfer these merits to all members of the Maha Sangha, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us not forget that amongst them are the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us transfer these merits to my teacher, Guru Swami Nuhanse, as well as all the other monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others or inviting others to join them. And by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our devotees and friends of the monastery, who for the sake of merits continue to sustain the Maha Sangha, be that by contributing towards the construction of the monastery or providing the Maha Sangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines, as well as those who generously pass on their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our teachers, our employers and our employees, and to all those who've helped us and supported us and assisted us in any way, shape or form possible and available to them. May they all rejoice in these merits and they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to the preservation of the Sambhuta Sasana, as well as the fulfillment of the Sambhuta Sasana. Let us transfer these merits to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. And by the power of these merits, they, may they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us take a moment to transfer these merits to our loved ones who have passed away in our name, those who have predeceased us, our ancestors, our forefathers, as it is in the, in the blood, sweat and tears that they have shed today. We live in comfort and luxury and are able to live a comfortable life. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to those who have sacrificed their lives for the peace and harmony of our nation, the members of the police force as well as members of the armed forces. Let us also transfer these merits to those who would have lost their lives in the, in the wars, be their friend or foe, as well as those who would have lost their lives in natural disasters, 
such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, blizzards, as well as the pandemics, reminding ourselves that amongst them will be those who have been friends and family to us in this infinitely long journey of sansara, those who would have helped us, supported us and assisted us in numerous ways, with an abundance of compassion and loving kindness and gratefulness towards all of them. Let us take a moment to transfer all these merits to all of them. May by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power and blessings of all the maids we have acquired, you and I and everyone become a Rahatan Mohanse in this very life itself, and may be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of Rahatan Mohanses and Arahat Teranin Mohanses in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. And the members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. Raga Ginnani Dettnva Desha Ginnani Dettnva Moha Ginnani Dettnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Mamada Sialu Loka Sialu Satnvayo Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Raga Gini Niveva Desha Gini Niveva Moha Gini Niveva Nivan Sapaladeva Nivan Sapaladeva Nivan Sapaladeva Tundran Gesu is Yalanta Mahaguna Belen Sila Loka Sila Satyam Nibbana Paramasukain Sugit Paravetra Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu